Hello everyone and welcome to today's uh, live stream, uh, uh, an event organized by the Posthumanism Research Institute. Um, we, uh, we had a bit of a difficulty <laughs> uh, logging in and everything, so that explains the five minutes delay, so, um, but thank you for your patience. Uh, today, we have a talk by Dr. Matthew Haler, who is a senior lecturer in contemporary literature and digital cultures at the University of Birmingham, and is also the series editor for the new series at Bloomsbury Academic, the Posthumanism in Practice uh, series, book series. And that is the topic of today's talk, uh, Posthumanism in Practice, How Do We Do? Posthumanism. What it what does it mean to do posthumanism to put it in action? And so, without further ado, uh, Matt, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just share my screen <coughs> um, and get these slides going. Is that looking okay? Wonderful. Um, so firstly, I want to say a, a huge thank you to Christine for hosting me today. Um, I'm so glad that I could join you all at the PRO. Um, as Daniel, uh, uh, sorry, as Christine said, I have the pleasure of editing a new series at Bloomsbury um, with Christine and with Dr. Daniel Sands, and the series shares its name with my talk today, Posthumanism and Practice. I've been invested in this idea for quite a while now. What would it mean to really put posthumanist ideas to work and to work at scale? What would it mean for posthumanism to become such a common way of thinking about the world that it changed how people do things? So today I want to start to I want to start to explore some of the edges of that problem. Um, like doing posthumanism like a tongue on the wound of an extracted tooth. Uh, I'm just prodding at some things for the moment and I can feel the shape of them, but I'm not quite sure how they fit quite as yet. So please forgive me for working through some thoughts in a public forum like this. Um, I hope that what I can say today can usefully provoke your own thinking around this question of what it is that we do with posthumanism. I've been thinking about the long-term goals of posthumanist work, the goals that those of us alive today will never actually get to see reached. Humanism and humanist assumptions underpin these vast networks of widely held beliefs, institutions, ways of thinking and acting, ways of researching, ways of doing life. And so if posthumanism is to do the work of taking some nebulous us beyond or away from humanism, then it's gonna to have to make its way into these same networks. And this is the project of generations, in the same way that it took hundreds of years for humanist assumptions to take root. And it's unlikely that posthumanism is actually going to be on everybody's lips um, while any generational kind of change happens. Any more than a psychologist assisting a team in making a new AI application currently thinks that they're doing humanism when they presume a model of a universal human subject for that AI to emulate. But I think I want to start with an idea that was kind of forced on me in the last couple of weeks. Um, I don't think that posthumanism is a philosophy. I gave a short work in progress type talk to a group of lawyers and political philosophers working on human enhancement the other week. And I love chatting with them because they don't let me hand wave. Um, they asked me where a posthumanist approach really gets us as specifically a posthumanist approach. And practically, I, I realized that we can say things like we're more entangled with the world than we might tend to realize. We can show how humanist assumptions uh, lead to particular kinds of errors. And we can argue the political implications of ongoing humanist legacies oriented around European male and species supremacies. But the biologists and economists and physicists and computer scientists and social scientists and therapists and ecologists that are doing really good thinking and research, they already know and demonstrate this kind of thing all the time. Mycologists and entomologists and astronomers know all about complexity and the entailed effects of making lazy assumptions. They don't need the word posthumanism to do this kind of work. If they're already breaking down much the same concerns that a posthumanist would, but without needing the same tools, then where is posthumanism headed? What is it doing? Why is it worth listening to? Because we don't just want to be talking to the researchers that are lazily following established dogma, even if they still need to be engaged with. Humanism and humanist assumptions aren't a coherent philosophy either. Humanism is largely internally inconsistent. It changes over time. It has at various points explored human relationships with animals, nature, and with one another, with subtlety and with rigor. And in general, humanism isn't a bad position. 
that can then just be replaced with another better position, which post-humanism couldn't even be if that were possible anyway. But there are ways of exploring interrelated legacies of um, European thought, legacies that we can usefully draw together as being humanist, and then ways of drawing attention to them and working out how to modify or move beyond them, and with this project being called post-humanism for as long as it's useful to do so. So I'm starting to think that post-humanism is maybe better thought of as a theory in an English literature 101 kind of way. Marxism, feminism, queer theory, eco-criticism, post-colonialism, disability studies. Undergrads are too often trained to use these things like hammers. Find a text and do a reading of them, a Marxist reading, feminist reading. It's an awful way to understand these complex, diverse, historically malleable bodies of thought. But the real benefit to theory in this sense comes from raising readers' sensitivities to aspects of texts that might otherwise go unnoticed, whether that's the experiences of women and trans and non-binary people, of class conflict, the implicit violence against people and places that limbs the edges of so many works of art. With a theory course under your belt, texts suddenly seem to give up secrets hiding in plain sight. I have no interest in doing post-humanist readings of the world. Post-humanism can't be a hammer capable of cracking every nut through some simple application of force. But what I think it can do is become a project of consciousness raising that has the potential to draw researchers' findings together across disciplines to shape industry practices and to reach out to publics. Even as we live in incredibly politically divided times, there are conversations around equality that I couldn't have imagined as a teenager. Ideas can and do travel. And I meet a new group of 18 year olds every September who have already started to work out their relationships to intersectionality, the critical studies of race, class and gender, and before even setting foot in a university because of what they've read online and what people in their lives, on screen and off, what they're discussing. Ideas can travel. So rather than trying to say to you some fixed answer to what post-humanism is, I want to start to define it by the kinds of consciousness raising work that it might do and to acknowledge the huge range of ways in which it might get there. So here then is a, a very preliminary sketch of what taking putting post-humanism into practice seriously might actually look like. From the outset, I want to say that most of this is not new. Many post-humanist scholars do these sorts of things. But I do think that these are important threads that need to be more explicitly articulated, and particularly as academics start to train a new generation of scholars in post-humanist work. We can't fall into just making another hammer for undergrads to wield when the world needs them trained with a scalpel. Anyways, I think that these are five areas that I'm primarily interested in when it comes to putting post-humanism into practice. Uh, and I'd love to hear about any other broad threads that I've missed out on here. So my first point is uh, outline that post-humanism might outline more nuanced thinking in areas dominated by assumptions that we can usefully think of as being humanist. And post-humanism is about the defamiliarization of common sense. This is probably the most recognizable work of post-humanism right now, rooting out humanist legacies wherever they're to be found, identifying the kind of harm that they might do, looking at the kind of assumptions that we make day in, day out. My next point is that post-humanism might identify new ways of doing things once this damage is done, and I think it, it is damaging to do this kind of work, but in a productive way. This is the crucial next move to me. We can't end that critique, and if critique becomes a fairly homogenous end point, then the people we need to reach out to will swift, switch off horrifically easily. I firmly believe that identifiably humanist ways of thinking are bound up with the ongoing legacies of racist, misogynist, ableist, homophobic thought and action, and particularly when coupled with destructive, violent, expansionist and acquisitive patterns of capital generation and colonization. But there are huge swathes of global populations that switch off if they think a critique can be reduced to straight white men equals bad. If we can clearly trace harms and pose real solutions through new ways of working, then post-humanism has a far better chance of traveling outside of a relatively small group of invested scholars. Um, and I'm kind of interested in the kind of pragmatic approaches that we might have to better communicating post-humanist messages. Um, post-humanism can also bring together insights from across disciplines and fields of knowledge and practice that are doing related work, but that are not always or not typically within uh, using the same languages or frameworks. This seems like a vital area of development that I'll look to later on today. There is a huge amount of work that post-humanist scholars already draw on and are inspired by that itself never uses the word post-humanism. Fungi have been particularly significant in this area over the last few years, with the implications of wood wide webs, rhizomatic structures, and radical entanglements being hugely generative for post-humanist scholars. 
but a lot of the work undertaken by mycologists doesn't come into contact with the thinking that leads on from it um, in posthumanist work. When insights in physics, biology, medicine, law, sociology, politics, history, geography, philosophy, computer science, and on and on, are escaping or unavoidably challenging humanist legacies that have haunted each of these disciplines, what posthumanism can do is provide a framework for understanding the potential for travel between these insights across the quad. When a computer scientist moves to embrace neurodivergence as a way of understanding how AI might be thought of differently, when they escape a simplistic and homogenous human cognition to attempt to emulate, then if this doesn't get phrased as posthumanist work, they will never meet the ways in which similar moves are happening in biology and the outlining of the implications of microbiomics, or the ways in which disability studies and theories of race, class, gender, sexuality, and colonization have each been engaged in long histories of the refutation of normative subjectivities. And then add to this the huge diversity of indigenous philosophies and knowing and living practices that have engaged human animal, human plant, human environment, and human human relationships for millennia. There's so much to listen and learn from. And we make a huge mistake if we see posthumanist thought as being new. Posthumanism, again, it is not a philosophy. I think it might be an act of curation and extrapolation. Posthumanism then can start to describe the stitching together of these wide ranging and long undertaken moves and thought and give coherence to the common task of embracing complexity, challenging and responding to our inheritances and expanding the horizons of the possible, joining together these ways of thinking um, which for many researchers will be for the first time. Posthumanism might also explore ways of sharing insights that can lead to positive changes in practice uh, and in the full range of arenas where we might recognize humanist assumptions uh, as dominating. As I mentioned before, we might need to be more explicitly pa uh, pragmatic in establishing how posthumanist insights can be widely shared. We need to learn how we can communicate posthumanist insights so that they do things. Because there's been around 600 years of atrocities and petty violences undertaken in the name of the human as conceived by European humanism. A generic human need has shaped huge swathes of global culture. How posthumanism might lead to new ways of doing things needs to become its central problem. The conceptual work of definition and example remains vital in terms of refining perspectives and supporting imagination and pushing forwards. This is messy, complex work that is at the heart of any project of thought. But we also need to work out how people will go home, go to school, go to the fridge, go to the shops, go on holiday, and maybe most importantly, how they will go to work differently tomorrow because of this cohering program of research. Um, and my last point here is that posthumanism needs to face up to the implications of its ways of thinking. We have to work out what the implications of all this might be. Posthumanism represents the potential for drastic change, and there will be, there must be, negative effects as part of that. I'll touch on this uh, a bit more shortly in a case study. But I just wanted to note from the outset that posthumanist work has a bit of a problem with the joyous tearing down of the past. A successful implementation of its potential will have to address the varied crises that it might cause. We're right at the start of working out what those might look like, let alone how they might be communicated as worthwhile to a larger group. Before I get into a case study of how posthumanism might be put into practice that picks up on some of these areas, um, I really enjoyed listening to the symposium on weird research from the other week um, at the PRI. Um, and ideas about the, the weird and posthumanism have been kind of swirling in my mind ever since. I'd initially thought that I was going to talk a little bit about the digital humanities and posthumanism today, but I hope that it's okay. I think that I'd rather talk about weirdness, my first example. I want to start by thinking about weirdness as an initial way um, of getting into thinking about posthumanism and practice. And to think about how posthumanist work is inherently weird, but it's a special kind of weird. So I've been looking at different definitions of weird fiction for a while. And it's become clear that a stable genre definition of what weird fiction means is really hard to pin down. But a recognizable feeling and orientation comes up again and again. In the 1920s and 30s, H.P. Lovecraft wrote tales of elder gods, of unimaginably vast and ancient alien creatures, an abyssal pulp horror which revels in the limits of science and human perception, where death cults go mad, architecture twists and warps, and hallucinations, outbreaks of disease, and distortions of human and animal bodies occur across continents. No one who has come to the, uh, close to the effects of these awesome beings can ever quite describe what they've seen, certainly not Lovecraft's narrators, 
And it's this failure of expression twinned with the cosmic immensity and power of what is trying to be expressed that immediately typifies this kind of story. It's what Mark Fisher identifies as a fascination for the outside, for that which lies beyond standard perception, cognition, and experience. For an example of the kind of thing that we're talking about here, take the final lines of Lovecraft, Lovecraft's Nihilathotep and its description of ghastly midnights of rotting creation, corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, charnel winds that brush the pallid stars and make them flicker low. Beyond the worlds, vague ghosts of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks beneath space and reach up to dizzy vacua above the spheres of light and darkness. And through this revolting graveyard of the universe, the muffled, maddening beating of drums and thin, monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes from inconceivable unlighted chambers beyond time, the detestable pounding and piping whereunto dance slowly, awkwardly and absurdly the gigantic, tenebrous, ultimate gods. For Anne and Jeff Vandermeer, such fiction um, represents the pursuit of some indefinable and perhaps maddeningly unreachable understanding of the world beyond the mundane, striving for a kind of understanding even when something cannot be understood and acknowledging that failure as sign and symbol of our limitations. Um, and I really hope that kind of this starts to immediately feel kind of posthumanist, um, that these are things that would be recognizable from a lot of the literature in the field. Weirdness then is less about the specifics of genre convention than the feeling produced by the representation of unspeakable or unimaginable strangeness or wrongness. And in its canonical forms, this weirdness of human smallness is nearly always expressed as a negative. As Jeffrey Weinstock puts it, dread provoked by the suggestion that humankind is insignificant and adrift through a cold universe of unimaginable and often malign powers and forces is the milieu of the Lovecraftian weird tale. <clears throat> These nebulous attempts at definition again show that weirdness is less a way of marking genre and more a category of experience. Charlie Mieville eventually throws up his hands in his own definition. Weird is an affect. We know it when we feel it. But if we take the weird seriously as an affective rather than generic category, then I think that we can also start to refine it, in particular to remove the emphasis on dread, malignancy and fear, and also to recognize that the feeling of weirdness is something that we can encounter in our lives beyond fiction and with some regularity and with important results. The weird is the feeling produced when a character encounters something which not only goes beyond the reader's prior or predicted experience, but which calls into a question uh, what before you would have taken as common sense. But this also happens outside of fiction all the time. And in fact, I think we can only recognize this affect in fiction because we experience it outside of fiction. So that when we see the profoundly weird events in Lovecraft, we're able to know some of how we'd respond in the same encounters. One of the most significant moments of real world weirdness, not coincidentally the culture that Lovecraft inherits, is the end of the 19th century, with Freud's darkly desiring unconscious, Darwin's evolution, and geology, paleontology, and astronomy's vast expansions of time and space. This is a Lovecraftian warping of the world, a series of attacks on common sense that we're still reckoning with, and it's also the origin point of a host of threads in posthumanist work as well. In his work on the philosophy of weird realism, Graham Harmon again finds latent in the human body that horrific ancientness. At some point, even vegetables and fungi become our immediate family members. These reflections show that all the twisted intricacies of human literary, cultural and political history are cruelly outstripped by an engulfing background of long temporal darkness. It faintly reminds us that we in turn will be swallowed in darkness. It faintly reminds us that we in turn will be swallowed in darkness for our far off descendants, who would probably strike us as utterly grotesque or even worthy of genocide if it lay within our power to erase them. This is certainly a weirdness that we can recognize from Lovecraft, and it includes a violent refusal of the otherness discovered in the dramatic revelation of time in our evolution and ongoing embodiment as a species. But there's another way of encountering the same revelations here, just as weird, but with a completely different tenor. Carl Sagan in Cosmos is no less dramatic in his claims, but his famous words feel entirely different. The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood were, ma uh, were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. We are the local embodiment of a cosmos grown to self-awareness. We have begun to contemplate our origins, star stuff pondering the stars. I want to call these two very different kinds of weirdness beautiful and sublime weirdness.
Both of these descriptions feel weirdly precise. Um, sorry, both of these uh, descriptions feel weird precisely in their excesses, in their reality outside of common experience, in what they force us to reckon with about ourselves and our embodiment. But in their very different cadences, they require further differentiation beyond just being weird. Harmon sees a sublime weird vertigo in the vistas of time and space revealed by physics, but Sagan, he experiences a related but alternately cadenced beautiful weird in that same arena. If the sublime weird is about encountering something more than ourselves and being terrified, then the beautiful weird is about encountering that same thing and experiencing it as an unfolding of possibility, as a site of potential. The world just became joyfully larger. And for me, that's the work of posthumanism. Posthumanism is the embracing of the beautiful weird, the real things that exceed you, that exceed the human, and that we have to wrangle with, but that we can take joy in doing so joy in making the world a little bigger. The microbiome is weird in this way. Estimates as to the number of cells in a human body put us at being comprised of about 30 trillion human cells and 39 trillion microbial cells. So over half by number, if not by weight, of the cells which make us up come from non-human life. And they do all sorts of things, making nutrients available in our food and protecting us from toxins, destroying invasive diseases, changing how we smell and releasing signals during our development that change how our organs grow. We could panic at the thought. The amount of non-human matter that makes us us could be a frightful assault on the ego. But the science writer Ed Yong has a totally different and more beautiful response to this vertiginous reality that again feels like something that you'd encounter from a writer that is steeped in posthumanist thought but Jung never mentioned posthumanism at all. My visit to San Diego Zoo feels different. Although the place is a riot of color and noise, I realize that most of the life here is invisible and inaudible. At the main entrance, vessels full of microbes part with money so that they can file through gates and see differently shaped microbial vessels that loiter in cages and enclosures. Trillions of microbes, hidden within feather-coated bodies, fly through aviaries. Other hordes swing through branches or scuttle through tunnels. This is the living world as it actually is, and although it is invisible to my eyes, I can finally see it. It is a dizzying change in perspective, but a glorious one. The world here gets a little bigger. The beautiful weird isn't inherently better than the sublime weird, and some things ethically must remain sublime. We need to encounter the unimaginable sucking singularity of the climate crisis as sublime. For example, as a call to action, it is the sublime weird. We should be terrified. But the beautiful weird is a way to see things differently, without fear, without rejection or violence, an aesthetic that marks a site of tremendous political power that we don't always tap into. To live in Lovecraft country, after all, is to live in terrible, corrupting fear. In Lovecraft's work, as Mievel notes, awe is inextricable from a racism so obsessive it is a hallucinogen. Lovecraft's horror at otherness wasn't just in the depths of space or time or the vast elder gods. It was a horror that he saw all around him, in faces unlike his own, in the cultural myths of abject savagery that he couldn't escape, and the women that he seemed to fear so much. To be scared into silent disbelief or rambling madness by the other that you can't comprehend, that seems to describe a large portion of the political discourse that we're faced with at the moment. A far right uh, account on Twitter sent out the image, uh, this image with the caption, this is the future that liberals want. You were meant to look at this image with dread, with awe and horror. How could this be okay? How could this be what uh, people want? To understand racism and homophobia, you need to understand this scene as capable of weird terror. A policing of normalized visibility and permission allows difference to be catastrophized. Put another way, something shown as normal always sucks power away from the sublime and can drive a wedge big enough to allow the first possibilities of beauty. Luckily, there is still the beautiful impulse that makes the world a little bigger. Um, weirdness as only wrongness is politically inert at best. To encounter the fact of something excessively beyond your comprehension and to only feel that in terms of your own insignificance is at the root of a slide towards nationalism and the sorts of brutish discrimination and outright, fa uh, outright fascism that we see increasingly performed in public life. What if I'm not the hero? What does that say about my own desires? What does this say about my status? What does it mean that I can't understand what's going on? How can I control it? We have to learn and demand the practice of finding beauty in the face of the fear of difference. It's not about escaping the feeling of weirdness at all though, but about changing its cadence so that when we encounter something weird again, 
we can control the worst of our sublime impulses. A show like RuPaul's Drag Race, for instance, is important not because its weirdness is normalized, it fights to protect its weirdness, but weirdness becomes celebratory, at least for its fans. If the show was a zoo of the sublimely weird, it would be profoundly damaging, and to viewers who can only encounter it with a sublime fear, I have no doubt that it plays that role. But for those who can take a delight in a world which is more strange, wonderful, and viable than they might have thought, with more color and possibility, the show provides both a thrill and a comfort. This is a variation on the important refrain for popular culture that representation matters. But it's not just about representation of people that look like you, if you've been forced to become used to no one on screen having lived your experience. The beautiful weird potential is in seeing people who look like what you didn't know you could be. The world gets a little bigger. Donna Haraway's writing on the entanglement of humans and technologies and animals and ecologies makes her one of the most beautifully weird theorists writing today. And in different language, she notes the difficulty and importance of training ourselves in beautifully weird thinking. Thinking located in the discoveries of real excess, thinking that is scientific, not magical, but beautiful in its power and potential. She says, each time a story helps me remember what I thought I knew or introduces me to new knowledge, a muscle critical for caring about flourishing gets some aerobic exercise. Such exercise enhances collective thinking and movement in complexity. Each time I trace a tangle and add a few threads that at first seemed whimsical, but turned out to be essential to the fabric, I get a bit straighter that saying that the trouble of complex worlding is the name of the game of living and dying well together. One of the lessons of cognitive science is that we all necessarily have shrunken views of the world and its possibilities uh, are too big and too rich to encounter with the embodied apparatus that humans have available to us. This means that weirdness will always be a fact of our lives. We will always meet things that we could never have predicted and that demand for us to reckon with them. The question then becomes what wedges we wish to drive and why so that we might open up the horizon of the beautifully possible whilst holding on to the sublime fears that might guide our protest. In either case, the feeling weirdly begins the same way. I can't believe the world is really like this. And it's this weird feeling that posthumanism needs to work with to support people in facing together. Okay, so I want to use the second half of my talk uh, to look at a case study of putting this kind of thinking into practice, of trying to embrace the intense weirdness of cross-disciplinary insights that might be usefully united under an approach that we can call posthumanist and starting to chart their implications. Um, what I want to discuss comes at least in part from a piece that was recently published about bioethics and moral responsibility um, in this collection edited by Danielle Sands. I've been trying to think through some places where humanism might go unchallenged or might be very hard to challenge. And underpinning our legal system is a humanistic model of responsibility that necessarily places blame on individual human actors. Subjects, not objects, are presumed to act freely and for the choices that they make, the price of that freedom is responsibility. The traditional humanist paradigm views persons as free and responsible for their actions and ultimately for who they are and what they become as persons. As such, the self stands apart from the world in the most significant way, morally and metaphysically, originating acts spontaneously, freely and independently. This traditional concept of the core self is the bedrock upon which our entire moral and legal system is based. Yet we do not really believe that there is such a thing as this core self works but it does not exist. This puts the modern defender of our moral and uh, political order in something of a difficult position. Though Hill never uses the word posthumanism again, reading his account of the core self in legal theory certainly makes me think about the extent to which this imagined core self actually works as he suggests it does. And so I want to look at how posthumanism in its rejection of foundational humanistic principles might force us to return to our models for justifying blame and therefore praise and to think again about who or what is responsible for actions in the world. Posthumanism's commitment to exploring humans' complex and constant relationship with their environments alongside biological, sociological and psychological discoveries which benefit from being understood within a posthumanistic frame they necessarily pry that door open and offer new grounds for approaches to justice and the role of sanctions and reward. But the challenges that this presents to our normative ideas, morality and justice are also troubling to say the least, and they need to be acknowledged and explicitly positioned within an ethical frame which accounts for their implications, 
as I suggested right at the start, I think this needs to be a part of what it means to put posthumanism into practice. It is striking how little engagement there is with moral responsibility, uh, with the moral responsibility implications of our being entangled with the world. In posthumanist research, humans are often positioned as porous, as entities through which other entities might run, and therefore as less in control than we might tend to think we are far from being the center around which everything else orbits. I've got people like uh, Bridotti, Ferrando, Barad, and Haraway all springing to mind here when I think about this construction of the subject. But even as the seat of agency clearly travels and uh, clearly changes in such approaches, little attention has been paid to the challenges that posthumanism therefore presents to our administering of blame and praise. Um, Jane Bennett joins these other posthumanists in noting that agency is a confederacy and human actants themselves turn out to be confederations of tools, microbes, minerals, sounds, and other foreign materialities. I think that's a fairly recognizable refrain from posthumanist work. But Bennett also makes the rarer move of beginning to explore where this might lead, asking how would an understanding of agency as a confederation of human and non-human elements alter established notions of moral responsibility and political accountability? In seeing the human as a porous assemblage of human and non-human material, Bennett starts to realize that this federation of actants is a creature that the concept of moral responsibility fits only loosely and to which the charge of blame will not quite stick. Um, she only uh, expands on this a little further, but her conclusion gets to the heart of what I want to emphasize here. Autonomy and strong responsibility seem to me to be empirically false, and thus their indication seems tinged with injustice. In emphasizing the ensemble nature of action and the interconnections between persons and things, a theory of vibrant matter presents individuals as simply incapable of bearing full responsibility for their effects. It's well beyond the scope of this talk to describe what a society which genuinely questioned individual responsibility would, could, or should look like. Instead, I want to suggest that insights like this, which trouble the boundaries of individual human agency, they necessarily contribute to reopening questions of moral responsibility, and that this is something that posthumanism must face up to. Um, in my work, I take a broad view of posthumanism, and I tend to use Catherine Belsey's useful description of the humanist subject, the free, unconstrained author of meaning and action, the origin and history, unified, knowing and autonomous. This is the perspective that I'm aiming to move beyond in my work. Any rejection of these features as descriptive of human subjects, any abandonment of the unified knowing and autonomous subject is, at least for my purposes, posthumanistic. Blame, as I've said, is normatively based on humanist principles. When we say that someone has committed a crime, for example, we see them as morally responsible precisely because we also see them as unified knowing and autonomous. They're a single agent able to make a judgment, they're acting of their own free will. They and they alone chose to act in a knowingly dangerous or harmful way, and therefore they deserve punishment for the consequences. Driving a posthumanistic wedge in here might already seem unwise, not least because the humanistic approach appears to capture something that is fundamental to our biology. As Bruce Waller notes in his discussion of moral responsibility, humans typically want to hold people morally responsible. We especially want to punish them for their wrongdoing. We feel a powerful urge to strike back at them. And this desire, this indeed the visceral biological need to strike back at trouble, can be found in chimpanzees and rats. It existed long before humans. But throughout his work on responsibility, Waller also explores the, the predictable bleakness of this strike back response. This driving need for the often violent satisfaction of justice seems something that is also well worth resisting. Similarly, if posthumanism aims at a better understanding of human experience and an improvement of our ethical position in the world, then this desire for punishment needs to be accounted for. The Waller never mentions posthumanism. Again, in his focus on questioning the aims and outcomes of allotting moral responsibility, he outlines a position which can support and benefit from posthumanist theories of the subject. One compelling aspect of Waller's rejection of moral responsibility um, is luck. Um, he frequently compares two actors in theoretical scenarios. Uh, for today, let's call them Anne and Betty. Anne makes good decisions and Betty makes bad decisions. But simply blaming Betty and praising Anne, in doing that, we forget the histories of these women, of all the things which came into play in making them who they are and the range of decisions that they are literally able to make as individuals. Anne, for instance, might have been lucky enough to have been born more intelligent in some useful way. She might have been better educated, she may have had better role models. 
Each of these aspects may have then shaped her cognitive abilities, limited her stresses, and expanded what she is now able to conceive of in comparison to Betty, who was unlucky enough to have none of these gifts. It's not even that Anne may not have put a lot of work into being who she is, but the fact that she has the capacity to cultivate a good character, capable of excellent decision-making, is not solely down to her. As Waller puts it, if Betty had been a different person with different capacities and a different history, then she would have acted differently. If she had exactly the same history and resulting character as Anne, she would have acted as Anne did. But that fact has no relevance whatsoever for the question of whether Betty justly deserves blame or punishment in the world in which she actually lives. Here then is the essence of Waller's argument. Who we are conditions what we do and can conceive of doing, and who we are is in significant part a product of historical luck. We might also then factor in things like present luck, such as uh, our mood or features of the environment or how much our attention is prone to wander. Again, things that we have luck that if they go well for us, we are lucky to have them go our way. If we accept that we're not morally responsible for the outcomes of luck, then we might also not be morally responsible for our characters. And this would demand in turn that we must reconsider our responsibility for our actions. Again, this seems to me a thoroughly post-humanist idea. Throughout Staying with the Trouble, for example, Haraway describes human beings as persons conceived as individuals. And she's continually attentive to things and living beings um, can be in, uh, how things and living beings can be inside and outside of human and non-human bodies at different scales of time and space. Altogether, the players evoke, trigger, and call forth what and who exists. This leads her to an unavoidable question. What happens when human exceptionalism and the utilitarian individualism of classical political economies becomes unthinkable in the best sciences across the disciplines and interdisciplines? Seriously unthinkable, not available to think with. All of our entanglements tend towards making the unified knowing and autonomous subject literally unthinkable. We are products of the luck of the confluence of beings, environments, and experiences that make us us. And this too must push at our sense of responsibility. Haraway is drawing on the field of microbiomics here, uh, the study of organisms that live on within species, such as bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Microbiomics explores how human life, as all life, is riven through and wrapped up with other beings whose activity plays a role in both what we experience and who we are. As Gilbert et al. put it, interactive relationships among species blur the boundaries of the organism and obscure the notion of essential identity. Organisms are anatomically, physiologically, developmentally, genetically, and immunologically multigenomic and multi-species complexes. The human as multi-species complex, Haraway's unthinkable person as individual, manifests in a number of ways that relate to inherited luck, including gut microbes shaping behavior and impacting on mental health. Such ecological entanglements are far removed from our control, and whatever benefits or frustrations they bring can usefully be understood as additional aspects of the kind of constitutive historical luck that Waller describes. We might also look at the emerging interest in the effects of parasites, such as Toxoplasmosis gondii, um, which have been linked in humans to risk-taking, gregariousness, and even elevated levels of entrepreneurship. Challenges to autonomy already appear in other areas of inquiry in biology, not least in the field of epigenetics. An example that, again, demonstrates how constitutive luck might shape uh, antisocial or risky behavior is the link between exposure to lead, particularly in early, including prenatal life, and an increase in criminality, and particularly in violent crime. These effects are particularly striking when looking at the effects of public health interventions. Lead pipes installed in American cities, for example, have been connected to a 24% increase in murder rates in the early 20th century. The rise in removal of leaded fuel in cars seems to be similarly tied to a rise and decline in violent crime, and air pollution more broadly has frequently been linked to violence and criminality. As Jessica Rees notes in her discussion of the effects of, lo uh, of lead toxicity, social scientists struggle to explain trends in mental health and social behaviors, including learning disabilities, adolescent violence, teen pregnancy, and substance abuse. The complex variety of factors influencing these behaviors and conditions presents a challenge to researchers, and they're increasingly looking more closely at early life influences. Pollution can, of course, only be seen as contributing, not determining um, elevated levels of crime. But other identified contributing factors include the effects of poverty, poor nutrition, and levels, of, uh, levels and quality of education. To put it bluntly, 
no contemporary study of crime suggests that a higher crime rate comes from the increased presence of somehow morally bad people in particular areas. Intuitively, this would be a wholly insufficient explanation. To have to see bad parts of the city, bad parts of the city as where bad people live, is precisely to misunderstand what might contribute to the occurrence of antisocial acts, how they might be prevented or minimized in the future, and how systemic discrimination can skew our understanding of criminal actions and actors in the first place. And so, a neat humanistic attribution of moral blame to the unified knowing and autonomous individual, in short, it risks recapitulating the logic that justified the Dickensian slum and which brought uh, and which brought into social Darwinism as an explanation of the social standing of poor, queer and non-white citizens. To try to instead understand the huge variety of uncontrollable factors which might contribute to individuals' actions, uh, adding together a diversity of currently siloed disciplinary inquiries would be a significant move towards instead better understanding human experience and how future harms might be reduced. Um, the biological, historical, internal and environmental factors that I'm uh, briefly bringing together here show how humans can be shaped by the things which not only surround them, but which pass through them and become a part of them. And this is inherently part of post-humanist discussions right now. And we might add further concerns from empirical psychology and neuroscience, building from Labette et al's uh, 1983 study of movement, which suggested that the intent to act can come after an action has been initiated, troubling the rational knowing subject as the originator of action. Soon et al more recently found that the outcome of a decision can be encoded in brain activity of prefrontal uh, and parietal cortex up to 10 seconds before it enters awareness, this delay presumably reflects the operation of a network of high-level control areas that begin to prepare an upcoming decision long before it enters awareness. Um, building on exactly these sorts of insights, Dirk Paraboom and Greg Caruso, in their discussion of punishment uh, in the wake of the critique of moral responsibility, also note that work in psychology and social psychology on automaticity, situationism, and the adaptive unconscious reveal just how wide open our internal psychological processes are to the influence of external stimuli and events in our, in our immediate environment. So, all of these field insights that I'm just sketching out here, none of them are currently saying the word posthumanism in their discussions. And the people working on lead levels aren't talking to the people working on the adaptive unconscious, who aren't talking to the people working on nutrition, who aren't talking to the moral philosophers, who aren't talking to the researchers in microbiomics. Posthumanism then represents an invitation to step back, to pick a humanist legacy, in this case, the determining of the subject of blame in the legal system, and then to try and unpick its essential assumptions from the ground up and draw together threads that spread across fields of research. But to put it into practice is also far more complicated. Is there some project to be done where we do start to get these kinds of researchers talking to one another? What would the outputs be for a research project like that? Or might writing about these things in consistently interdisciplinary ways, which is, I guess, what I'm trying to do, might this start to expand who is joining posthumanist conversations more organically? Or does putting posthumanism into practice only come when we can try to support the complexities of exploring the ethics of whether human beings are morally responsible for their actions to the extent that they deserve praise or blame? Is posthumanism in practice a posthumanist legal system? How would that even work? How would we even start that conversation? I feel keenly the sense of injustice that will come in asking anybody to reconsider the responsibility of the perpetrators of criminal acts. It doesn't feel balanced by knowing that this argument applies just as much to undeserved praise as to blame. How useful an ally is a posthumanism, which reopens the question of responsibility, even if it doesn't doubt the badness of the act, even if it would only want to understand in order to work out how to change for the better. But follow the threads and blame does feel more difficult and moral responsibility does feel more challenging to attribute. In attempting to understand what contributes to our actions, contemporary sociological, criminological, biological, economic, environmental, neuroscientific and psychological hypotheses, they already provide a model for thinking through a posthumanistic approach to querying moral responsibility. They are already exploring the things which are both unexpected constituents of us and out of our control. And as we start to add together all of these avenues of research, the exceptions to the unified knowing and autonomous human actor might quickly become the rule. The coherent, rational and free subject starts to seem like a myth. And all of these weird parasites, poisonings and influences, they seem a lot less extraordinary. 
It would mark a huge shift in a deeply ingrained sense of justice and is maybe the biggest ask that posthumanism could make. And yet it is one that, to my mind, it is inherently unlikely to be able to escape asking. If we take everything into account, if we take the range and intensity of our entanglement seriously, to what extent is the person as individual morally responsible for their actions? And therefore, to what extent can we ethically dole out praise and punishment? In this arena, is a posthumanism in practice a demand to recognize the gamma of harms and their effects and to plan for rigorous amelioration, but to also have this exist alongside a radical compassion and a rethinking of justice and our rational, rationales for punishment? It is a shocking ask, but I think it's one that's likely already been asked. Um, thanks very much. Uh, that'll be me. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. This, this was brilliant. Um, and um, we already have some questions in the chat. A reminder that you are invited to submit your questions there and I will relay them to our speaker. So the first question is, uh, is by Trang. I don't know if that's the actual name or a short that they use, but um, the question is, you mentioned that there's so much work out there that engages with ideas of posthumanism, but doesn't actually use the word posthumanism. This makes yeah. me wonder whether we need this term at all. And that's the first part of their question. The, the second part, yeah, yeah. you also discussed weird fiction <laughs> and how what the weird does is the work of posthumanism. This mm -hmm. reminds me of object-oriented ontology. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, triple O and posthumanism. <laughs> um, maybe. Okay, so the first bit of the question is, do we actually need the word posthumanism? Um, I hope so, because of the, we just started a book series. Um, yeah, <laughs> my hunch is that we probably do, but not for the reasons we've historically thought that we need it. Um, and so, yeah, I think like what what I'm kind of advocating for in this paper is that posthumanism describes the work of bringing together all of this challenge, challenging material, all these challenges to kind of humanist subjectivity and humanist assumptions, um, because we need some way of describing that increasing coherency of that project. Um, but that is. Um, it's going to be incoherent itself because it is just this act of curation rather than a set way of thinking that you can then start to apply to things so but it's only because humanism itself is not coherent um it, it's not some kind of like neat philosophy um it's hugely diffuse over time um and we already do that act of curation and collection together and say there's all these things that go on um in kind of post-European enlightenment thought and we're going to kind of draw those threads together and describe them as humanism because they place a particular subject at the center and then make assumptions about how the world should be based around that subject and post-humanism I think does a similar kind of job and we can we need to go into all the same areas that humanism is already doing that kind of work and start to draw those connections together as we kind of already have done in terms of defining humanism um there's just not that existing public and political desire to do the act of coherence for us so it's really interesting what kind of researchers are going to have to do in order to establish that coherency but to me that is is why we keep that word posthumanism is to describe trying to draw these threads together um the relationship between ooo and posthumanism um object-oriented ontology um i think everyone would have a different response to this i i'm really interested in graham Harmon's work on the distinction between the real and the sensual um, and the limits of our access to the real world as it is and our only being able to access uh, kind of the sensual aspects of the world which emerge as um, kind of a collaboration between myself as an object and the object that I'm encountering the sensual object appears um, uh, kind of in the relationship between us and I'm, I'm really interested in the ways in which object-oriented ontology from the ground up gives us a world which is full of real things that exist independently and don't rely on one another in order to exist but that the world that we encounter is always um, definitively collaborative we literally cannot exist in a world outside of that kind of collaboration so those are the kind of areas that i've been interested in kind of in Harmon's work 
Um, but I don't necessarily think that OOO and posthumanism are inherently good bedfellows. Um, but they often ask a lot of similar questions about what we can access um, and the kind of entanglement between um, kind of people and um, and objects in the world. I think I am persuaded um, by OOO's idea that there are real things in the world that pre-exist the relations that they enter into. Like that's an area that interests me. Um, but I kind of like Jane Bennett's um, position of kind of sitting between object-oriented ontology and something more like, um, yeah, kind of more like a, a whitehead process philosophy. Um, Bennett draws from both of these fields in some really useful ways for me. Um, and so I, I just find her a generative thinker. I'm really not allied to any particular camp. Um, I think that we can learn a lot from both. Um, so yeah, definitely not an expert in that connection. Um, yeah, if I may interject here, um, I, I really liked how you were um, um, pitching posthumanism as as a curation and not a philosophy so much as a theory. Um, and 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 I thought your emphasis on the joy. Well, I don't know if you you intended it as uh, intended it as a as an emphasis, but it, it's it resonated with me. Um, this idea of a joyful tearing down. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and and as you say, well, that that's all jolly and good, um, but but what then, and how does one move <laughs> forward? And and yeah. and the idea that it, the idea of curation, to, to me, and I don't know, maybe that that's my own connotations. Is how does one curate those consequences? Um, mm -hmm. And and and. There, there's a dimension of care that that is implied in the act of curation, um, a, a, a dimension of appreciation, um, perhaps even love of those various others, and mm -hmm. and the necessity to care. So yes, we've dismantled this, but yep. now we need to care fully. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Does that does that resonate with no. you? And, and... Yeah, when you were just speaking, it reminds me of um, Sayyid's Orientalism, where mm. he's kind of he's breaking down all these things, but he absolutely understands the beauty of colonial stories. Like it comes back to it again and again in Orientalism of like I completely understand why this fetishization of the East and all these kind of like tales are being told. Like it, they did huge harms in the world. They justified colonial missions. We need to rip it all down. But Saeed absolutely understands the appeal of the adventure story and the colonial adventure story particularly. And if he didn't understand the beauty of it, if he couldn't collect those stories together of like political discourse and artistic discourse and design discourse um, and discourse of economics, he's doing that act of curation is Orientalism. It's because he loves all this stuff. He's fascinated by it. It's beautiful. Um, he wants to bring all those things together and then say, and now look what the damage does. When that act of curation, for me, is bringing together all these oddly beautiful things and showing you how harmful they are. But our society has already brought all those things together and said, this is what the savage is. Um, that act of curation has already gone on. And like, in my head, I'm now starting to try and track that onto the sublime and the beautiful impulse again, like um, where like you have all these stories of savagery and you experience that in a sublime way. The, the kind of like the beautiful way of doing that is to kind of recognize the huge diversity of peoples and like looking at the world kind of very differently and less fearfully. Um, so yeah, I think there are other kind of historical acts of curation that occur in kind of critical race studies and post-colonialism that might give us a kind of model there as well. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, there, there's a few questions that popped up in the meantime, and I'm, go I'm going to bundle two together, uh, one from Cathy and one from Trang. Uh, so Trang says, I, abso I absolutely agree with you about individual and moral responsibilities, but if we are products of our social situations and context, how could we change from these current situations? And Kathy asks, mm. would you see a connection between the degrowth movement and post-humanism? And I see a connection there because we're talking about social situations and context. And so yeah, the yeah. degrowth movement is certainly something that plays into that. So thoughts about this? Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, so I really, I've been reading a lot of Greg Caruso's work recently and he, 
he's not against prisons. He's not an abolitionist in his response to um, rejecting moral responsibility, but he wants to change the reasons why we punish. Um, and so, uh, sorry, he, he wants to stop punishment, why we take the actions that we do against individuals. And he sees it as being legitimate to have prisons, but instead of it being an act of punishment against an individual, it's more um, an act of protecting a community. Um, and the different kind of cadence of the rationale for why we might do particular things means that prisons don't have to be hell holes. Prisons don't have to be about um, being as punitive as possible on the perpetrators of crime. It's instead about saying this person is not safe for our community. Um, and he calls it a, a kind of like public um, hygiene model um, of like uh, justifying why we might act in particular ways. And there are a lot of um, kind of problems with that model. Daniel Dennett has critiqued that um, model in some interesting ways. Um, but the, what it shows is that we could rethink what actions we want to take as a society in order and to what ends. Like, what do we mean by justice? What do we mean by the kind of ethical things that we do to people who do real harms. This is certainly not about saying that real harm isn't being caused. I think that's crucial. It's not about even saying that there aren't people out there with bad characters. Waller is absolutely certain that people can have bad characters, but to what extent we're responsible for those bad characters and should therefore be punished for them is kind of the interesting thing. So we could start to look at some a major entailed effects in the legal system. Um, the degrowth movement. So the pursuit of growth as an ends in itself is doing kind of damage. Um, and it certainly seems to be a story that we're weirdly wedded to that seems kind of common, has become commonsensical. Um, and that idea of focusing on stasis or shrinking, I think, the connection that I would see is that it is just as challenging a problem um, as trying to address our legal system. We're, it is so built into the fabric of how we have started to structure national and global societies um, that the unpicking of it seems literally unimaginable. Um, the idea of not putting humans at the center and growth at all costs and like let's get to Mars and let's colonize another planet and expand, expand, expand. Um, the the kind of the trickiness of persuading people that that might not be a wise or good thing to do or an ethical thing to do. That to me is like a, a particularly post-humanist problem. Post-humanism inevitably raises that degrowth question in the same way as it inevitably, to my mind, raises the moral responsibility question. Um, I don't think they're necessarily more entangled than that, but they're, they're similar classes of very challenging problem that post-humanism cannot shy away from. <laughs> Great. Um, there's a question here from Mitch um, who says, I'm concerned about creeping biological determinism when humanity's post-human scholars look to the sciences mm -hmm. for support for their mm -hmm. theoretical arguments. Can you speak to the ways in which the sciences might prove dangerous for post-human scholarship? Hmm. Yeah, so I tried to say that these would only ever be factors which contributed to challenging the seat of responsibility, not kind of determining. I don't think that because of a particular biology, therefore this particular action, um, because of this social circumstance, therefore this particular action kind of occurs. So I think like, yeah, just making sure that post-humanism is rigidly kind of like anti-determinist um, is, is an important kind of thread to keep in. And whenever we're engaging with empirical sciences, they're saying because of X, therefore Y, looking for the ways in which that might not be the case. But I think like when you look to the scientists that are doing good research, they are really doing that kind of stuff anyway. Um, it's, it's very rare that um, kind of science is not looking at the variety of confounding variables that will be in every uh, experiment. So by hanging out with good scientists, we fall into less of those traps. And so by a uh, part of like this act of curation is amplifying those scientific voices that are being rigorous, that are not being determinist. Um, and so kind of, um, yeah, the, the way that I think we avoid some of this danger is forging genuine positive collaborations where we're really learning from one another. 
about what it means to do good science and means to do good humanities work and means to do good sociology. Um, so like that that community building is something that has not been going so well for a little while. Um, and I, I think that's a real problem if we want to start drawing from other uh, sciences. I don't know, otherwise it doesn't feel dangerous to me. And if anything, we're a danger to the sciences a lot of the time because we tend to use things as metaphors rather than treating them as they actually are. Um, I work a lot in cognitive humanities um, and the amount of like bad metaphors we take about how brains actually work and then it makes its way into journalism and then cognitive scientists don't want to talk to us anymore because we've metaphorized what they're taking very literally. Um, so the really good cognitive humanities work sees philosophers and cognitive scientists and humanities scholars really talking about what's going on in the brain and thinking about the actual implications of that for humanities work. Um, so yeah, moving away from metaphors and trying to see what we're actually trying to say, I think really helps in those kind of conversations. Um, Mitch, if you'd like to come back on this, I'd, I'd be really interested in what kind of dangers that you see as there. I, I may have absolutely been missing something that's important for you to raise. Well, while uh, Mitch cogitates on this, uh, there is also a question from Naomi, um, who says, I found your paper very interesting. I agree that there are F that there are effects on the individual that negates or at least lessens the, lessens the blame we might put on a person for their actions or behaviors. Is it suggesting that agency and morality is then negated? I mean, that would be the, the kind of hard way of reading it. And I honestly, at the, at the kind of start of my asking these questions, I just want to see post-humanist scholars wrangle with the kind of genie they've let out the bottle rather than ignore it. Um, but to what extent we genuinely do not bear responsibility for our actions is something that I'm, I'm trying to wrestle through. And it's really interesting trying to wrestle it through from kind of a personal perspective, like to what extent do I deserve blame and praise for my actions? Um, and then thinking about how we might reconfigure a society. Um, it's, so, it's such an incredibly challenging problem. But yeah, I think the, the hard reading of adding together all of the ways in which our experiences are structured and the product of things that are outside of our control, if we, if we buy into this idea that we should not be responsible for things that are attributable to luck, morality seems really really troubled in a way that genuinely I, I, I don't have an answer to and I find really troubling and it's post-humanism that got me there um it's not reading these moral philosophers like I already saw that in the post-humanist work and so then I started looking and I'm like man there's troubles everywhere everyone's asking these kind of troubling questions about responsibility and not talking to one another how in that act of curation starts to begin but then the moment you start to curate it you're like where is responsibility sitting right now because when you start adding it all up that's the actual scary one. No one bit of this is particularly scary to me. I mean, it's, it's the composite, and that's the posthumanist bit. Uh, Mitch says that he appreciates your response from earlier, so um, he, yes, nothing was missed. Cool. <laughs> that was prepping. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, on, on the question of this, and there's also a question from Simon Adams, so I'll, I'll get to that, Simon. Uh, but yeah. um, it, on, on this question of moral responsibility, I'm wondering if, um, and, and maybe that's a cheeky move on my part, because I'm struggling with the same questions as you are, and, mm. and it seems to me that, that post-humanism is, is complicating that very old debate between determinism and, and free will. Mm -hmm. um, to, it's, it's brought it to a heightened degree, but then I wonder if, yeah. if rather than speaking about <laughs> ethics or trying to design an ethics or come up with an, a post-humanist ethics, whether our yeah. emphasis shouldn't be on an ethos, um, i.e. embracing mm -hmm. the humility we have been uh, notorious in, in ignoring um, yeah. and, and then and, and embracing a, 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 an approach of care and, and humility and understanding that, yes, um, that, uh, that, um, that we may be determined in all kinds of ways that we are not mm -hmm. able to acknowledge, but but as long as, as the whatever it is that we seem to be in control of is is yeah. is geared in a certain way, then then yep. perhaps that's that's all we can really aim for. But that that doesn't yeah. resolve the issue of what we do with people who do really really <coughs> bad things. Yeah. Um, um, and and our our work and the work of 
publicly telling stories and coming up with um, uh, uh, like this ethos that's in the air that will genuinely shape how people act. Like it's not that when you parent a child, it doesn't have an effect. It absolutely does. But, and what I'm saying is the the parent has more responsibility for the child's actions than than the child does because like the parenting kind of matters there. So what we can do is with that kind of humility in mind, just think about how we tell better stories, how we share resources better, how we minimize pollution, how we stop people being affected with toxoplasmosis. Like we can once we start to do this identification, we can say we as a society are responsible for the kind of actions that our citizens have because of these effects out there in the world. So we are responsible, at least in large part, for the crimes that occur. We should be starting to, you know, ameliorate this on, on our own terms, rather than just locking up the person who was bad, that perhaps could not have done any other other thing in the circumstances they found themselves. So so just as much as, <clears throat> as, as an individual agent is a collective ag agency because of everything that it bundles together, mm -hmm in this sort of envelope. Yeah, yeah. I'm using air quotes because I mean, <laughs> all right. of this seems inappropriate, but, but yeah, yeah. We, we also need to think in terms of collective agency, agency as, as right. in the larger collective and how, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's, again, like this is a European problem. There are, um, I, mm. one of my PhD students is Nigerian. And I was speaking to him and he says like uh, a crime in a community back home is seen as a failure of the community. Um, and I right. thought that was really interesting, right? So again, I'd like I am so not an expert in that. That was a fleeting comment, but it's stuck in the back of my head. And I wonder if we started to look at other legal systems over time and other small and large communities that do think about collective responsibility and the kind of influences that might happen over the individual, whether there are already models out there for what a post-humanist legal system would look like. Because again and again, this work is already being done and just not being heard right. because we're not kind of like hashtagging it with post-humanism. Like there is a, that act of curation is important here. And and because we continue sometimes to, well, oftentimes to lack humility. <laughs> uh, right. Simon right. here is asking, um, is there a difference uh, between your use of post-humanism and critical post-humanism? Mm. Um, so I wrote a chapter for the new Routledge Critical Posthumanism Handbook um, that kind of uses my approach. Um, yeah, I don't know if critical posthumanism has really penned itself down yet either, I think would be my response to that. So to me, critical posthumanism is about using posthumanism in critical ways um, to kind of ask historically critical theory kind of questions. and. I think that I definitely do that. So I'm a critical posthumanist in that sense. But I think critical posthumanism is also about being critical of posthumanism. And I think that I do a lot of that as well. And so trying to bring in um, kind of uh, in, in the chapter that I wrote for, for that collection, I was saying like, we really need to be thinking about the kind of work that's going on in critical race studies and decolonization and thinking about other kinds of historic challenge to normative subjects. Um, that's something that posthumanism is kind of failing to bring in right now and really needs to, or it's doing it a bit, but like kind of we need to be better at. Um, so I think that my use of posthumanism is critical posthumanism, but it's on those two terms. How can we use posthumanism critically, but also how can we be critical of posthumanism and be kind of self reflective as a project? Um, but yeah, it depends on your definition of critical posthumanism, and I probably offended someone, and I'm sorry. Um, which is why I always just say, this is how I'm using posthumanism. Like, this is what it means to me. <clears throat> but in, so I, I guess I want to ask you then, mm -hmm. is, is, is posthumanism in the way you deal with it more of a method than a theory? Hmm. I don't know if I could teach it to somebody though. Like to me, a method is something you can train somebody else in. Um, okay. So that's why I kind of, that's why I kind of mentioned the sensitivity raising. Like when, when I teach feminist theory to first years, I'm not teaching them a method that they like. You know, if I was teaching them titration, then I can show them how to do a thing. Like when I'm teaching them how to do a feminist reading, I'm not saying apply X Y Z and like you'll get this response. What I'm saying is here are the stories that have been hidden the histories that have been hidden the kind of things that you need to be looking out for the kind of things that are in every text but we often don't have a language for until we read these theorists and we think about the experiences of people and we listen um when you read a text now what jumps out at you that it didn't before 
and it will be different to them. To me, that's, I don't know, it's, I mean, it's on the edge of a method, but like, I kind of like this idea of a theory a bit more because it is about that personal sensitivity raising. Like, you and I have read some very similar stuff recently in posthumanism, but I think that whenever we pick up a play that we've never read before, we'll pick out different bits, but we'll both be kind of attentive to the similar sort of stuff. But it's not a method we apply and we, we get the same result out. I think that's what I'm hesitant about with method. Okay, yeah, and I, I, I appreciate that distinction. I mean, it's definitely, it, it's definitely a theoretical stance that informs mm -hmm. how one mm -hmm. does things. And, and so, yeah, yeah. but not, not a, sure. an applicable X, Y, Z, do this, do that, yeah. and this will be the outcome. Yeah. Um, so there's a further, uh, oh, there's a question by Simon. Uh, can you please say the name of the Routledge collection again, the, the one you mentioned um, in which oh, you have an yeah. entry? Let me, um, I don't want to butcher it because there's two that have a similar title, so let me just grab the right one. But um, I believe it's the Routledge Handbook of Critical Posthumanism, and I will double check that. Yeah, the Routledge Handbook of Critical Posthumanism. Okay. And there's probably an introduction to that handbook defining what critical yeah. posthumanism is yeah, or what they understand it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's why I got it wrong. It's uh, the Powergrave Handbook of Critical Posthumanism. I forgot where I published. Oh, the one yeah, in which Powell I have Grove. an entry as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was being silly. Yeah, I thought you were being very one. prolific, having entries in two <laughs> handbooks at the same time. Okay. That would be amazing. No, sorry, my bad. Powergrave Handbook of Critical Posthumanism. Okay, so not Rutledge. Um, yeah. Okay, and <laughs> now there's the there's a comment from Naomi um, on, on this discussion we were having um, where she says, I think we could find those collective models, the, the models you were talking about uh, in the example you brought up, in traditional communities um, that is indigenous ways of knowing and healing and they could offer great examples for dealing with these problems on a collective level. For sure, yeah, and that's something that I'm really trying to, I, I would like that to be kind of the future of my work, so I've started to um, I did a, a small project where I went and interviewed Shinto priests about um, the kind of experiences of nature and entanglement and things like that. And I, I'm really interested in finding out more about um, non-European philosophical and scientific traditions. Um, and the more that I read and, and learn and listen, like the more that, yeah, none of this stuff feels new, um, but it does need to kind of come together. Um, because it's also not kind of being heard by the people that need to hear it as well. And again, that seems to be that kind of post-humanist work of kind of platforming and collecting um, is really interesting. And again, I hope this is something we do with the series. Right. And I think I, I've had interesting discussions with Simone Bignall, who's doing fantastic work mm. um, in that regard. Right. And, um, and and th there's, a, there's a risk sometimes on the part of, you know, European inclined thinkers like us to to encounter these indigenous modes of, 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 of thinking and knowing and, and, and romanticize and fetishize. And, and I think one important yep. thing as well that is that, yes, we, we need to recognize those, those affinities and, and, and those mm -hmm. ideas that we find generative, but at the same time, mm -hmm. we need to also pay attention to the significant differences yeah. that are also at play. And so definitely opening ourselves, but, but it would be, as bad to just embrace it naively yep. as it right. is to ignore it, right? So yeah. that's also interesting. Oh, yeah, it's it's really rigorous scholarship to do this kind of stuff well, and so that's why it's learning yeah. from kind of decolonial scholars about their method and their kind of like theorizations and their understandings. But like you have to be so bedded in in the histories of these communities or like of indigenous communities in order to understand all of what's being drawn on to make what seems to be relatively simple claims. In the same way as when you learn a language, you don't get all of the kind of subtleties and variations. It's the same kind of thing. Right. Um, and so, yeah. The, there's, a, there's another comment and a question by Tamara. Uh, who says, I refer to my style of posthumanism as a framework or lens through which I view the world, which I think is how you are referring to posthumanism as well. A key aspect yeah. for my work with posthumanism is futurism and action-oriented communities. 
do you see posthumanism working towards creating community-based action and change? Yeah, to me, that, that's got to be what posthumanism in practice kind of means, um, is how do we actually do things differently? And it will probably start from micro moving towards macro. So it's going to be like, how would I as an individual act differently? With these kind of things in mind. Then how would that spread out to kind of like my community practices and how might I build a community around a particular kind of way of doing things that might be at work, might be in terms of like how I raise children, it might be in terms of like my relationship with my dog, like, you know, there's lots of different micro ways of doing this. Then that next question of how that scales, um, I think we've seen a lot less of that in action and that that's the area that I'd love to start putting some pressure, like what's it mean for a thousand people to put a post-humanist idea into practice um, and genuinely, what would that look like? And and so that idea of like, if you had a post-humanist court, if you had a genuinely post-humanist therapist, like what does that look like? Can you work with clients in a post-humanist way that is meaningfully a change that produces better results from the previous assumptions, et cetera, et cetera. Like the, that's, that's the really exciting work to me is how we go from this like kind of little micro moment in the small communities, that, that scale move. Um, I'd love to get funding for a project to do exactly that kind of thing. Yes, great, thank you. Um, I'm, I don't see any other question or comment in the queue, um, but we've already had a pretty good discussion and really interesting questions that came up. So um, I'm just gonna give it a few more seconds if someone has a, a lingering thought or or, comment or question, now would be the moment before we wrap up um, today's event. Okay, well, um, seeing none, I'm sure you, you're you welcoming uh, any, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. as these things go, you know, someone might go for a walk tonight and think, oh, geez, I wish I had asked that. <laughs> so um, yeah. I'm assuming they can send you a message and uh, yeah, absolutely. To please engage. reach out. Thank you. Great. Yeah, well, thank wonderful. you so much. Th thank you so much, Matt. Uh, this was this was great. This was fantastic. Um, and um, just a note to the audience that our next event, which is part of the Posthumanism in Cinema <coughs> series, hosted by my colleague Russ Kilborn at Laurier, uh, who's also part of the PRI, is taking place on May fourth at four p.m. Eastern time. And the topic is more than human posthumanism human technological relations and bioethics. Um, so this is taking place on May 4th. Uh, there's information on our Facebook page on this event and a link to um, register for the event. They are using a different platform. So you can find all that information in there. And as a rule, any event that we have, um, we post on the Facebook page. So subscribing to the page, liking the page will get you that information. And um, recordings of our events are also posted on our YouTube channel. So you can, you will be able to find this, the recording of this session on the YouTube channel in a few days. And uh, past recordings are also available there. And then we will, after the May 4th event, we will have a bit of a spring summer break and we will resume our events um, in September where, uh, when we will have a talk by Joanna Ziliska. Uh, so the date is yet to be um, determined, but it's it's more than likely in the first half of September. So keep your eyes peeled for an announcement uh, on this. So again, thank you for attending and thank you very much to Matt for his discussion of posthumanism in practice. Thank you. Thanks, Christine.